I'm going to remove these three resistors here that are burned out in the hopes that I could identify them. You'll notice that if you look carefully, only two of the resistors, R7 and R8, are in the silk screening. The third one isn't. However, there are provisions drilled in the board for it. So it's very interesting, probably an afterthought. We'll take a look. I gave it a good cleaning with isopropyl alcohol to really see what was going on here. I wanted to be sure. And what we got is all of the resistors are in parallel, uh, bridged across these two circuits here. And the third one was literally drilled in. There, there's no provision for it. It was just drilled right after the, uh, right after the trace there. And it was folded over to be part of it. Definitely an afterthought, which basically means that what we're looking at here is just a um, one resistor bridge going across here. It's just one resistor value. I think they did this. My, my guess is, is number one, so they could use lower wattage resistor by having more of them, which isn't really ideal because it doesn't really work the way you think it does. Um, and number two is so they could basically keep swapping out resistors till they had... Uh, the perfect combination to calibrate the meter. I think that's what they did. And that's why we have th these three things here today. So let me see what resistance we need here by bridging across the resistance box to get the uh, the value that we're looking for. I've used uh, one of the pairs of holes to attach some leads here. You can see those two metal pieces hanging down. They go to nothing, but it's going to allow me to attach alligator clips across to be able to hook up to the decade box. I know that these original R7, R8 resistors are only for the times one measurement and the other resistors over here are for the other values. So I'm able to leave this out of circuit right now and test the calibration. So right now I'm working with 100 and what I've done is I've put together a table from my resistor box because it's not entirely perfect but I want to get as close as possible where uh, the left side is what I want to see on the meter and the right side is what I have to dial up on the box and I've measured it against my fluke. So now I'm gonna hook it up to the meter and dial in those values and see if the uh, this uh, um, ohmmeter is calibrated for the 100 setting. So we're starting off at zero and then we're gonna bring this up to 100 by dialing in the box to 97. So we're gonna bring the tens up to nine and this one up to seven. And we're seeing uh, just about, not far off on this one. So off by a couple of ohms, but this is this other one was already off by an ohm or so, so that's about fine. And let's see what happens if we bring it up to 200, and that's going to be 194. So I'm going to do that now, and that's going to be by bringing this up to 197,654. So it's reading a little bit low. Let me check the zero again. Another challenge is there is drift within the cables too themselves right here. So if I if I shake the cable. We're going to see some drift like that. So it's going to need new connectors, but I'm just trying to find a, a happy point where it's stable. See, I let go of the cable, and now, I mean, it's still connected, but the connectors are really crappy. I connected this side right to the, uh, to the switch here until I could put a new connector on. It just makes the reading more stable. I don't have to worry about bumping it to the cable. It reads a hair low, uh, just under 200, but that's fine. And now I'm just going to move my way all the way up the meter here to uh, 300, 400, 500, 6, 7, 8, and this is 9, and then even 10, and then 2,000, it just adds 1,000 on, there's 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and then finally 5,000. So uh, this 100 time setting is good, I'm going to move to the next one. The 10K values on the decade box are spot on all the way from 10,000 all the way to 90,000. So I don't need to write down any conversions for that. We're just going to move right on to it. For the 10,000, we see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And that's good enough for me for 10,000. So I'm just going to go back to the one times, calibrate those missing resistors, and call it a day for this. I decided to put new leads on before I started doing the one times ohm calibration because at that measurement, you know, the leads have a significant impact on the reading. So these are going to cool down and we're going to start measuring from the leads now. We can no longer uh, measure from the shortcuts on the device at that level. So here's my clutch. Don't laugh. It works. This is uh, 1%, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 ohms of resistance 
uh, shortest path possible as to not incur any extra resistance and measuring one ohm at one percent reads just slightly under or as I follow the needle just a little bit high towards the zero set and the hope is that if I clean this up I can take out a little bit of the resistance in, in the shoddy connection. It's just a trace amount, you know, maybe a tenth of an ohm or something, and bring that needle a little bit back to the left. On the 10, it'll read just to the right of the 10 using my calibrated 10 ohms. But the uh, times one is back in calibration with this. So let me clean it up and see if it improved. If it didn't, there was really nothing I could do about it because I don't have any half ohm resistors. And quite frankly, this is good enough. Um, if I take one resistor out, it'll read uh, just over the 1 to the same graticule, or just over the 10 to the same graticule. So it's like a half ohm resistor, it's got to go in there to do the job. This is it. I cleaned up the uh, connections, made them tighter, soldered them all together. It lowered the resistance ever so slightly, and I have uh, recovered uh, almost half a graticule. So not bad, almost on the 1. We'll try the 10. The 10 should look worse because they separate more as you get up to the top. And we can see the 10 is also just under one graticule low, and there's nothing I could do about it at this point. I've given this meter as much attention as it deserves. It works as a multimeter, very sensitive on ohms, and that's about as far as calibration goes for that. Uh, works good. Voltage works. We're going to close it back up and call it a day. We're back at the ranch, and we're going to take this unit right here, reassemble it, clean it up, and install it back. This is going to be the last piece we're going to be installing. Unit is now cleaned up, reassembled. Uh, we're going to run just one more test. We're going to throw a resistor on there, make sure everything is okay. Once that's done, we're going to throw it back into the complete test set, and that will be the last component to be reinstalled. We can see this 50 ohm resistor is now reading 50 ohms correctly on the one time scale. And on the 100 scale, it's correctly reading 0.5. So I just wanted to do a quick check now that it's all assembled. Voltage resistance is working. We install the unit into the machine. The second meter is now installed. We're going to mark this event by installing the, uh, the top hood onto the unit, which will go over and complete the entire assembly. Though the hood is not entirely ready because it still needs to uh, be painted, you know, some cosmetic work. We're gonna we're gonna seal the deal right here. We're gonna do that now, Jason. Pretty. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And you notice the uh, the new ends of the uh, cable. We gotta sand this. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna sand the uh, snap. Oh, that's a little cosmetic work right there. He's talking well, I mean, about the logo. We'll get some a block and some fine sandpaper too. Let me do that right now. Okay, fine. Let's take that off and do it now. I'm just gonna knock off that top layer of paint there. Bring out the shine. A little 220 just to knock off the black. Ooh. When the Snap-on guy sees this tool, he's going to have a flashback from the 70s. Yeah, right? <laughs> so Jason decided that it wasn't enough to just simply shave off the logo. He had to sand off chunks of paint from the front panel. So now we have to repaint the whole front panel all over again. Ah, it'll be all right. So now we can't do the whole, the whole thing's going back together moment. We gotta start the panel from scratch. Good job, Jason. Thank you. I'm actually gonna take half a moment and clean up this book, because this is absolutely disgusting and I'm not gonna work with this. I'm gonna clean up this book so we can start looking through it and uh, uh, get an idea of how we're gonna calibrate. Because we're not gonna see the big grand finale assembly just yet while we wait for the paint to dry for that uh, put together that we're gonna do. So it's gonna be some reading going on and seeing how uh, the pattern should look for the voltages for the secondary and secondary parade. Notably secondary parade because you can't measure the, the voltage values in, uh, in roster. But anyway, I digress. Let me clean this book up, see what we could get out of this. It's uh, interesting, in going through the book, I found a brochure for the MT655 when I was looking at the picture, I was like, wait a minute, this kind of looks like the machine, but it doesn't. Uh, assuming, obviously, this is an older model, we can see that a meter is built into here. Entirely different build-out. has all different sorts of things and an, and an extra meter. And um, I just thought it was kind of cool to bring this up. And it, it's, it's a sales brochure 
for this unit. And when you look at the unit in the cart, which is clearly the same model cart, having some of, you know, the same setups here, same components, we see that it's on the opposite side. But I, I just thought that was pretty cool. It advertises the MT4055 complete tune-up center. So saw that in the back of the book, thought it was cool. So I just wanted to mention that now. So here we have the complete unit all together in its entirety for the first time. And it didn't take Jason long to want to get the, uh, the Never Dull out to uh, polish up that last section. He could have used the Moz, but the Never Dull is just as good, I guess. But we're going to find out. Just clean it up a little bit. Just clean it up a little bit. But uh, if Jason were to step away for a moment, just Sorry. saying, I guess we could capture the, the, the ambiance of the, the whole unit in its entirety. And I'm thinking that the cables for the test leads, which I have pushed back behind the unit right now, would... would come forward somewhere and the drawers have holes in them I'm seeing that now by the way if we look down into the drawers we could see little tiny holes and I think that the test leads actually that, go... maybe that's what the holes are in the back yeah the the, 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 the that allows for the cables to go into the drawers no, and close then there would only be so so now that mystery solved for that at least so we know what that is very cool Jason keep doing your thing and we'll come back to this. Here's the original timing light that came with the unit as well. We're going to clean this up in preparation for testing. This is a timing and advanced light, MT241M. As I start to bring everything together, I'm doing some last minute cable repairs. I have it affixed here onto the uh, onto this overhead and it makes it easier to work on. Here's one example of um, some shielding that had gone away from this connection, which is impossible to focus on, take my word for it and it was all rotted, so I decided to cut out that rotted section. I'm gonna solder it together, some shrink wrap will go over, and that'll be done. I have some cleanup work on these to do as well, screw them back together and do a final inspection of this harness. I've also connected the uh, timing gun in, now that it's been cleaned up, and installed it on location in the back of the cart here where it sits, and you know, that's pretty much it. I also ran the uh, wiring for the uh, multimeter, which is a bad angle to see but the wiring runs through the front and i'll show you how it connects into the drawer here's the wiring for this for the uh, multimeter as i uh, placed it into the drawer going through uh the holes as i showed down here and that just allows you know the wiring to be stored in the drawer with a couple other pieces i haven't cleaned out the drawers yet but you know just to show you how it goes and to demonstrate that the timing gun works i'm going to point the uh the gun at the uh just the here and show that you can see obviously with the stroke and now we're going to advance it and we'll watch it move back and forth when I do that. So the advance is working. I gotta hold the button in. timing gun. Jason is now um, setting up the advance on it. That's actually, you see that mark right there? The on that the cam here? A little bit. So you get in. I hope you were under. I uh -huh. You see that mark on the cam here? A little shiny little white dot? Yeah. That is uh, top dead center on the cam. Okay. So my cam is installed correctly. And we also see that the timing gun is operating correctly as well. There's supposed to be a mark on this pulley. There it is right there. We advance it. See that mark right there? That's to set the timing, but it's worthless without the cover behind it. Yeah, I get that. The cover behind it has the uh, mark on it. But it does show the timing gun, oh, yeah. that system is operating correctly. Absolutely. We're going to call the timing gun good. Good. Move on to the next test. Can we take it apart and do something clean it or something? Probably the button, but that's it. We're also able to take a dwell reading that we see here uh, simply by shifting this unit over to dwell once we have the setup as listed in the book. There is a prescribed setup, an official setup for all tests. There's a commonality 
except where specified. So this is what we go with, this is what we use for wall testing, except obviously for uh, the, the timing that we did, which doesn't require connecting anything else but the timing gun pointed physically to the engine. The primary tester can show that uh, the voltage regulator test is about 1200 RPM. I use calibrated moist towelette to bring the uh, engine speed to about 1200 RPM. We see this on the unit over here that tells us we're okay. So I've got it set up for the primary roster and this continues to really look terrible on this unit and I often wonder you know, for the purpose of this video, I can bring it down to two cylinders to look a lot better. The problem is we'd be missing the cylinders that are not really good on this unit. There are a couple of bad ones that we will see when we give it some gas. I know some of this is a recap, but this time we're really going through the book specifically. on the screen. It's a shame that these cameras cannot capture those CRTs. This is some experimental work that I did at 60 frames a second in an attempt to try and get a better picture. Uh, I took some small clips. This is primary and this is primary parade. Uh, just trying to see if I could get this stuff to work. This was also muted at 60 frames a second showing me setting up some secondary circuit tests and all of this was trying to get a good display, but I had lost my ground, so the screen started to get messed up and I was trying to troubleshoot what the cause was. You'll notice I'm going through the settings on the unit trying to figure out what's happening. If you look over on the dwell meter or the tachometer on the left side by the gauges, you'll see that the meter is moving back and forth in, in all different places. It's the black cable that goes onto the engine block, which was disconnected, it somehow vibrated off which obviously with no ground, the signal just goes crazy. Finally, the last thing that was done at 60 frames a second was the cylinder short test, where I set it up to a certain RPM, set it to the first cylinder, and then uh, conducted the short enable while looking at the uh, CRT. And you could see all the way on the left, the first one in parade, when I hit the button, you could see it disappeared and then reappeared when I did that. And once I saw that, I moved to the second position and did it right there. To the third position to see that one short out and there it goes and then finally to the fourth one and wanted to see what that looked like at 60 frames a second i got that on video. <laughs> <laughs> all right this is it people this is the end of the project this has been what four months four or five months four or five months to restore this mt665 the only known operational working calibrated functional unit in the entire world even snap-on which has one in the museum doesn't have one that works and and we're done and this has been a challenge and a pain in the ass from the beginning and quite frankly i'm glad it's over no you're not you're gonna miss being here every saturday i'm gonna miss being here every saturday yeah. this thing this thing was literally every week was like you got one step forward right into another disappointment you know <laughs> with each circuit board and we're done and now this is ready for just full service, regular use. We've demonstrated everything works. Unfortunately, I wish that the CRT allowed for a better demonstration. It does not. I've tried every video possibility I can to demonstrate how it works, but the technology back then simply doesn't allow for it. So for everybody who had enough patience to get through what, all nine videos My on the series, and I don't even think Jason bothered to watch all nine I videos. I haven't finished them yet. You're a terrible person. I keep falling asleep. He keeps falling asleep <laughs> trying to watch it. 
thanks everybody for watching and wait for the next adventure in oh my god i can't believe he took all this time to restore that thing see ya take care bye